We'll, uh, we'll start just with a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll get into the notes and into the scriptures. Father, we just give you thanks. We give you praise again this evening. We're found in your presence, Lord. We're here just to look once again into the, the living word of God. And we pray, Lord, that you will make it alive to us this evening. We ask that your hand will be upon us. And we pray, Lord, for hearer and speaker alike. Lord, just guide our thoughts. And we ask, Lord, that whatever you want to speak to us or perhaps build into our lives, we simply pray, Lord, have your way and just grant that your will would be done. We ask your blessing upon everyone who's here this evening. And for all those perhaps who can't be here, we pray that they too would just know the touch of God upon their lives. And now, Lord, we just give this time to you. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that this evening, as we would center for a time around his person, our Lord, as we go through the scriptures, Lord, we know that our lives will be blessed and enriched as we just ponder his love and his greatness for us. And so, Lord, we just commit that to you now and we thank you for our Saviour and we ask all of these things in his name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Now, just bear with me one minute, please, and I'll... Okay, everybody. Notes are out, yes? That's okay. <coughs> For the sake of the tip, we're in the high priest garments and we're in session eight this evening. Now, last time around, whenever we're in this subject, oh, sorry, before we start, let me just say that there'll be uh, church dinner next Monday night, so there's no Bible study next Monday night. The following Monday night is Easter Monday night, so there's no Bible study that night either. Okay, so we're giving you a fortnight. That's nearly three weeks off, so you aren't doing so bad. And we'll, we'll announce it again, and we'll get back in sometime in, in April. But the last time around, whenever we were in this subject, we began to look at, you'll see there in the top of the screen, the top of your notes, the robe of the ephod. And we looked at it, we said how it was blue in color uh, and so on. And, and we also thought about the fact that it was a seamless robe, all one piece. You didn't know where it began at. You didn't know where it, where it finished at and so on. And, and how those things pointed to our Lord Jesus Christ. He's uh, the Lord from glory. He's the one from everlasting to everlasting, eternal. He has no beginning, he has no end, and so on. And we looked at all of those things uh, in connection with the Lord and the eternality of our Lord Jesus Christ. But let, let's read again, just to focus our thoughts tonight, because we want to we wanna finish the robe tonight. And so look with me, if you will, at verses, I've got 32 there on your notes, but look at verses 31 and 32 of Exodus chapter 28. It says, And thou shalt make the robe of the ephod all of blue, and there shall be an hole in the top of it, in the midst thereof. It shall have a binding of woven work round about the whole of it, as it were the whole of an habergoin, that it be not rent. Okay, and that's where we'll, we'll, we'll read verse 33 later on. In fact, no, let's just read verse 33 now. And beneath upon the hem of it, Thou shalt make pomegranates of blue and of purple and of scarlet round about the hem thereof and bells of gold between them round about. And so there you have the description of the entire robe. Now tonight for just a time, I want to think about this uh, that the Bible speaks of here in the King James as habergoin. And it simply means like armor plate. Um, the hole in the top of it that the head went through, uh, that hole had a, had a neck band or a collar, if you want to call it that. Um, and we're told it was woven or it was bound to the strength. It was so strong, that woven band that was on it or collar, it was woven so strong that it was as strong as an harbour going, like, like armour plate or, or chain mail, basically. Um, although it was a woven, a woven garment, but there was great strength woven into this, this uh, round the neck, this collar, or, or whatever it was, this band. In other words, and the scripture told us that we read there, so that it could not be torn, or it could not be ripped. That's what the verse tells us there. As it were, the whole of an harbour going, that it be not rent. It couldn't be ripped. Um, many, many people in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, many would try 
to strip Jesus of his great, uh, our great high priest of his divinity. The fact that he was the eternal one, the fact that he was God in the flesh, but they could not and they cannot tear that away from him. I want to say that before we go any further, because we're going to look at this for just a moment or two. His heavenly character, and remember, we said the, the, the blue in the robe shows us that he's the Lord from heaven, and he's the Lord all of the way through everything in his life. And so his heavenly character was tested, and his heavenly character was continually being tried as he uh, performed his earthly ministry and walked through this scene of time. It constantly come under attack, so to speak, to see if it would rip, to see if it would tear away from him. And, and every time man inflicted uh, that kind of attack or test upon him, it always came or mostly came in the form of, if thou be the Son of God. And we're going to look at that for just a moment or two this evening before we go any further. Remember the devil in, in the wilderness. In fact, first of all, go, if you will, to Mark chapter 1 there, because I just want to touch something that I mentioned the last night. Um, I just mentioned it. I didn't give you a scripture for it. I probably should have, to be honest. You may remember last time around, I said that he was, he was led of the Spirit into the wilderness. He fasted for 40 days. He was praying. And I said, you know, what about the wild beasts? What about the animals that would have been in the wilderness? I mentioned the last time round how David had to tackle a lion and how David had to tackle a bear and so on in, in his day. But look at Mark chapter 1 and look at verse 12 for just a moment. Because it says there immediately, he's just baptized of John, and it says immediately the Spirit drives him into the wilderness and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan and was with the wild beasts and the angels ministered unto him. And I mentioned last time around about how he was Lord of all, Lord even you know, of, of creation, Lord even of the wild beasts. And it tells us there that during those 40 days, obviously those kinds of things were there, but the fact that he was Lord meant that you know, he had complete authority over anything like that that he came up against. But go to Luke chapter 4, which is where we want to go in connection with what we're, we're thinking about just a moment. I want to just to pick up on that and, and toss that in there so you'd have a reference for that. But Luke chapter 4, and by the way, you can read the same thing in Matthew chapter 4. doesn't really matter where you read it from, but we're in Luke chapter 4. Okay, and let's read. We're going to read from verse 1 down to verse 13. Scripture that we're, we're very, very familiar with. But it says in verse 1, And Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. Now that's important. When they were ended, he afterward hungered. In other words, the Scripture is saying to us there that his flesh, his body, okay, it was hungry, it was crying out for something to eat. Okay, verse 3, And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it shall be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give you, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from thence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. 
And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him. Look at the last three words, for a season, for a season. So in other words, the life, the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, whilst that temptation, that testing is highlighted to us there in the Gospels, the devil was always at hand. And he was always trying to oppose him and always trying to, you know, just to, to, to get at him in, so, in some kind of a way. But the reason we read that is because of what I have there on your notes. If thou be the Son of God. Look at verse 3. The devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. Look at verse 9. And he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from thence. And if you look back at verse 7, he's saying, Now bear in mind that the devil, a created being, <coughs> is challenging his creator here. And he says to him in verse 7, If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And so his, his divinity, the fact that he's the Lord from heaven, the fact that he's God, is being tested, it's being tried. The enemy's trying to see if he can tear that away from him. He's in the flesh, he's God in the flesh, but the devil's attacking that. And you see, it talks here about the robe having this, this band or this collar around it woven so strong that it cannot be torn. And that represents to us the divine character in the nature of our Lord Jesus Christ. And remember, he has fasted here, as I've said. He's in a body of flesh. He needs nourishment. And the devil uses that very thing as the first temptation to try to rip this part of, you know, of, of his character from him in this way. His heavenly character, but, but the devil, of course, we know was defeated. And you'll see it there. I've, I've given it to you on your notes there. He was defeated each time Jesus said, it is written. Look at verse 4. Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. We see it there, uh, and we see it also in verse 8. <coughs> Excuse me. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And we find in the scripture, it is written is something that hits the enemy. And you'll see it put there on your notes. It is written. It does two things. The Word of God challenges the enemy, and the Word of God will put the enemy to flight. But the other thing about the Word of God is the Word of God strengthens the believer. Whenever Jesus said to the devil, it is written, he was attacking the attack of the enemy with the Word of God bringing the Word of God before him, the, the Word of power, the Word of the living God. But not only was he doing that, he was reminding himself in the weakness of his flesh, so to speak, in the human body, he was, he was bringing to himself the fortification of what the Word of God has to say. And for you and I as believers, it's good to remember that the Word of God does both of those things. Whenever the enemy comes our way, we can oppose him, we can attack him, we can put him to flight. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And we resist him with the word of God. But as we use the word of God, we also look to it to strengthen ourselves, to stand against that attack that the enemy would place upon us. Does that make sense to you? But it works, it works in, in, in both of, of those ways. And of course, in John chapter 4 and in verse 32, if you want to flick over to that one, funny, we, we touched just on this today, the message yesterday morning in church, speaking about the woman at the well. What it tells us there, Jesus says, by the way there in Luke 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And over in John chapter 4, uh, where we're turning to there, where's the verse that I am at? Verse 32. Yeah, verse 32. Yeah, but he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. He's the living 
word of God. And another place he said his meat was to do the will of the Father, the one who had sent him. And so we, we see all of this in action, both the attack of the enemy upon the Lord Jesus Christ and how in this particular situation the Lord Jesus Christ stood against him. Now, I want, I want to move on from that and I want, to, I want to take this on across for a moment or two. Uh, you're still, if you want to go back to Luke chapter 4, I should have tell, told you to, to keep, keep your finger there in there. But you can study this through the Gospels. This aspect or this side to Christ's nature, it was constantly, <coughs> constantly under attack. Always being tested to see if it could be torn, if you want to put it like that. And so back in Luke 4 again, he takes, what tells us, he takes the book in the synagogue, he takes the book of, of Isaiah in the synagogue, and he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. And he gives all of that that Isaiah states about him. And then he says, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Look at verse 21. And he began to say to them, verse 21, this day is is this scripture fulfilled in your years? Verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Look at the very next verse. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? And you see, there again is an attack upon the fact that he's God. He's the Lord from heaven. He's the God of glory. And if you look down at verse 29, you see, they, they wonder at the gracious words that proceed out of his mouth. And they say, is not this Joseph's son? It looks very much as if, you know, they look at him with admiration. But whenever you read on down through the section of the scripture, as the discourse continues, you find it by the time you get to verse 29, it says, verse 28, and all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him on to the brow of the hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. You see, there was something in the statement, is not this the son of Joseph? It wasn't so much an expression of admiration. I feel they were more like saying, who do you think you are? And Jesus goes on and tells them about how a prophet's not without honor and so on, uh, except in, in, in his own country. But uh, what I'm saying to you there again is there's this attack upon who he really is, upon this side of his nature. Go back, if you will, to Matthew chapter 10. And these are things that we know, but it's just good to highlight them in connection with this. Matthew chapter 10, look at verse 24. Matthew 10, <coughs> excuse me, verse 24. And he's speaking here a bit about persecution. Then he says, the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Okay, he tells his disciples, they call me Beelzebub. They say he's the devil or he's of the devil. And again, there's always this attack upon his divinity. Let's stay in Matthew for a moment or two. Look at, look at a couple of chapters over. Look at Matthew chapter 12. This time we're in verse 22. And it says, Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil blind and dumb. And he healed him insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? Looks so good. 
But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? You see, exorcism was common in that day. They dealt with evil spirits. The whole difference between the ministry of Jesus and the ministry of all those who were involved in that, Jesus just spoke to them. And they had to do what he commanded them to do because he's the Lord from glory. But they attribute this power that Jesus expresses here, they attribute it to the devil. And so he says, verse 28, but if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. And notice the conversation there starts with Beelzebub and it finishes with the Spirit and the kingdom of God. And do you see there, Jesus identifies himself with God. I, I love that little story, by the way, because Jesus is speaking and he tells them that he casts out spirits by the Spirit of God and that the kingdom of God has come onto them. All three persons in the Trinity are mentioned in that verse there. He's speaking, he uses the Holy Spirit to exercise his power over the demonic and the kingdom of God the Father obviously is touching them because that's what's happening in their midst. Um, Luke chapter 11, if you want to go there for a moment. Same story. But look at verse 20. We'll not read the whole story. <coughs> but in verse 20, Jesus says, But if I with the finger of God, cast out devils. No doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. Okay, that's how, he, that's how Luke uh, writes it for us in, in his gospel. So again, you see, the, he's cast them out by Beelzebub. His divine nature, his divine character is constantly uh, under challenge. It's who he is that is being attacked trying to tear away his divinity uh, and trying to tear away his lordship. Let's push the thought through, right on through to the cross, because this is where it all leads to. Go to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. Let's just read a verse or two there. Luke chapter 23. The first one is verse 35. <coughs> he's on the cross, okay? And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. So there, even, even upon the cross, the rulers and the people, they <coughs> test him. Look at the next couple of verses. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. There we have the soldiers get in on the action to try and test him as well. And then drop on down and look at verse 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged reeled on him saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us, right up to the very end. This part of his character is always being tested, trying to be stripped away from him, trying to tear that away. And this was thrown at him all of the time. If, 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 if thou be, as you claim to be, why doesn't this or why doesn't that? And he was crucified, we know, of course, and he died and he was buried. But to all of these ifs came the challenge of the resurrection on the third day. 
And in Matthew chapter 13, you need, well, you, yeah, yeah, just go back to that. Matthew chapter 13. Get the pages of your Bible used so it does. Matthew chapter 13, verse 55. It's a similar thought to what we've already looked at. <coughs> they said of him, Is not this the carpenter's son on that occasion? And you know, we find in the Gospels, God has a response to all of this stuff. Because right away back in Matthew 3, you didn't look it up, but in Matthew 3, verse 17, Jesus has just been baptized. The Spirit comes on him, John testifies, like a dove, and the Father, the voice of the Father from heaven, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So right through the Scriptures, we have this voice, this voice that challenges the eternal, the divine side of his nature. And right through the scriptures, God, you know, affirms that he is who he claims to be. You have another there, Matthew 17 and 5. That's quite simply the Mount of Transfiguration. You need to look that one up. But on that occasion, you know, you know, um, Elijah, Moses appear. They talk to him and so on. They're overshadowed and the voice says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased here ye him. And so to this voice of antagonism and to this voice of, of opposition, God at times in the scripture has wrung out a resounding affirmation of who he really is. The fact that he is eternal, the fact that he is the son of the living God. And spiritually speaking, it was thought that the robe of divinity had been rent from the Lord the day that he died upon the cross and they laid him in the tomb. They set the seal upon the stone. And we know all of that story connected with Easter. But instead of that, what was really happening in the midst of all of that was that Jesus was calling to engage the last enemy that he had come here to engage. Understand, that's what that's all about. He died upon the cross, he's dead. He's laid in the tomb and he comes to engage that last enemy, you know, and put it under his feet called death. The battle has been won and he goes and he preaches to the captives and the Bible says he leads captivity captive because he is the Lord of glory. Amen. And that's what's happening in all of that. And so he comes and he meets even with death itself. You know, it's like having a holiday. He gets out of the public limelight of ministry and he gets a couple of days in the shadows, so to speak, and he engages and he, he delivers people from that last enemy that has been put under his feet. And he defeats death. And irrespective of the guard or the seal or anything else that was there, praise God, he rose triumphant over sin, <laughs> over death and over hell. The eternal character of the living God. You know, someone has put it like this. Jesus was tested in everything. I read this just today. Jesus was tested in everything, but he never failed. And this is what one writer says. He was tested by the tempter. If you're a preacher, this is a good one. He was tested by the tempter. He was tested by time. He never had to say sorry to anybody. Isn't that right? So he was tested by time. He never cut across anybody in such a way that was sinful. So he was tested by the tempter. He was tested by time. He was tested by his own team. You know, I'm going to the cross. Oh, well, Peter says, you're not going to the cross. Get thee behind me, Satan. Okay. Lord, the wall forsake ye. I'll never forsake ye. Ah, before the cock crows, you'll deny even knowing me. And he's tested by his team. Thomas, Jesus dies. He rises from the grave. He appears to them in the room. Thomas is absent. And Thomas runs around for a week, completely at a loss of unbelief because he won't believe the fact that Jesus rose again. He was tested by another member of the team, Judas. 
Iscariot. We know he betrayed him and so on. So he's tested by the tempter. He's tested by time. He's tested by the team. He's tested by torture because we know what happened to him as he went to the cross. And he's tested by the tomb. And praise God, he was stood at all. He defeated it all. And he rose and came forth victorious. And he went back again into eternity by way of the Mount of Olives, Olivet. And he went back into eternity from whence he came as the mighty King and the Lord of all glory. And that part of his life could not be torn and it could not be ripped from him. And so on the back of that, I've given you that little scripture down, 1 Corinthians 15, and you'll know this, but let's turn over to that for a moment, if you will. 1 Corinthians 15. On the back of all of that, we can join, so to speak, with the Apostle Paul when he says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And he withstood every single test that was pushed towards him to try and tear this whole side of his character. But let's just move it on for a moment or two. If I would press the right button, it would help. It should have been that one there. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. <coughs> that gets us. Okay. Grace which cannot be destroyed. That's what I've called that next screen up there. We've already looked at the color of grace. We mentioned this the last night around blue. Very much speaks to us of grace. And can't we say, praise God, he has made grace to be unrendable. His grace can't be torn. And I've given you this nearly exactly as I have it here in my notes. Our works may fail, our love may waver, our passions may vary. And his grace, praise God, depends on none of these things. Aren't you glad about that? His grace can't be torn, can't be torn apart. And I've given you there just a few verses in connection with grace. You know the first, you need to look it up. Ephesians 2 and verse 8 says, For by grace are we saved through faith. And then listen to what it says. That's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. And it's not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay, the grace can't be torn. The grace can't be broken. Look at Titus chapter 2. <coughs> You'll know this verse whenever we read it, but if you're like me, sometimes you know the verse once you hear it, but where does it come from? I wouldn't have that in my mind all the time. Okay, Titus chapter 2, look at verse 11. It says, For the grace of God, notice it's God's grace, can't be torn. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all Man, And if you turn over, well, my Bible, I have to turn over a page, chapter 3, verse 17 of the same book of Titus. There is no verse 7. Verse 7, I beg your pardon. Chapter 3, verse 7. That being justified by his grace, by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And so we have grace which can't be destroyed. We have grace that can't be torn apart. Because praise God, this woven, strong habergoin or collar, uh, it assures us that this grace is completely unterrible because it rests in the person of his character, the God-man, the Lord who came from heaven. Okay, and that's what's significant really about the collar of this blue robe. Now, the last thing that we want to look at, everybody all right with that? Everybody still there? And by the way, those are only some thoughts. You know what I mean? There's, there's obviously lots of other stuff that you can think about and pull in there. That's just one train of thought that leads us, leads us through why this particular part of the garment was, was like that. Remember the garments, the robe, it's, it's depicting the Lord Jesus Christ as all 
of the pieces of the high priest's garments. Uh, picture him and depict him. But we come to the last part of it, and that's the hem. And let's focus on that for a moment or two. Go back to Exodus chapter 28. Although I got you to read it at the beginning, but we'll read it again. This time it's the next verse, verse 33. It says, And beneath upon the hem of it, upon the hem of the robe, thou shalt make pomegranates of blue and of purple and of scarlet round about the hem thereof and bells of gold between them round about. The only adornment, if you want to put it like that, the only adornment of this robe was down around the hem at the very bottom of the garment. Gold bells and pomegranates alternately all the way around the hem. A bell, a pomegranate, a bell, a pomegranate. Excuse me. I don't know if you've ever done a study into pomegranates. Have you ever, ever done anything like that? How many of you have ever thought of doing that? <laughs> Greta was up her hand, but she put it up very timidly. <laughs> um, in your Bible, pomegranates appear a number of times. Um, the next screen you'll see in your notes, we'll get to it in a moment or two, you'll find a number of fruit, and we haven't covered a lot of fruit, but I've picked out a couple or three there just to show how significant fruit can be as far as Scripture is concerned. But the pomegranate appears a number of times. But before we get into it, let me say this. Whenever a tailor or whenever a dressmaker makes a dress or a coat <coughs> and puts a finished hem upon that garment, it's a sign that the work is complete or the work is finished. It's a finished work. And praise God in our Lord Jesus Christ, we have what? A finished work. Thank God for that tonight. Now, the pomegranates are fruit. And we can think of that and say every believer is one of the, the fruits of the finished work of Calvary. You see, you're a fruit of the work of Calvary, and so am I. That finished work, we are the fruitfulness of that work, the fact that our lives have been touched and our lives have been saved. And there's coming a day, and we know the Scripture tells us this, when all shall stand together before him. Out of every tribe, every tongue, every kindred, every nation, and not just those you know, in that particular scene of time, so to speak, but everyone right down through every century, through every generation, will stand one day before him, those who are saved. And together we will sing that song that John always talks about, Worthy is the Lamb. Unto him who has loved us, washed us from our sin in his own precious blood. Unto him be glory forever and forever. Amen. We are the fruit of his finished work. But notice these pomegranates that tells us here they are colored. Look at verse 33. We're going to read it again. And beneath upon the hem of it thou shalt make pomegranates of blue and of purple and of scarlet. Same colors are being repeated to us again. Round about the hem thereof, and bells of gold between them round about. Blue, purple, and scarlet. And I want to just briefly suggest two things in connection with this. If we are the fruit of his finished work, okay, then again, the blue reminds us that we are the children of God in heaven. The blue speaks of the heavens. It tells us, in fact, go to Philippians chapter 3 for just a moment and we'll read it. Philippians chapter 3. I was going to just quote it to you there, but we'll read it instead. <coughs> Excuse me. Philippians chapter 3. Look at verse 20. It says, For our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Saviour, 
the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. And the blue pomegranate reminds us that we are citizens of heaven. Our conversation is in heaven. We're waiting from the Lord of heaven. And whenever he comes, he's going to transform our bodies to be something that is acceptable in heaven, to be with him. And so the blue speaks of our citizenship. We are not of this world. We are in the world, but we are not of it. And we are members of his heavenly kingdom. Our affections are to be set on the things that are above, not on the things of the earth. So the blue, if we are the fruit of his finished work, the blue speaks to you and me of our standing. We are heavenly citizens. The purple in the pomegranate, in this case, speaks of royalty. And the Bible tells us, look at 1 Peter chapter 2. One Peter chapter two, verse nine, and it simply says, "You are a chosen generation; you are a royal priesthood." The purple always speaks of royalty. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Some of us are more peculiar than others, admittedly, but you're a peculiar people. That you should show forth the praises of Him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. We should not obtain mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Okay, so we're royalty. We are a royal priesthood. Bless his wonderful and holy name. The purple speaks of royalty. So we are children of the king, and we have the blue heavenly citizenship, and we have the purple pomegranates. We're children of the king. We're royalty. But then we also have the scarlet. Go back again to Philippians chapter 1. And if you were reading your notes ahead like I was, you would have kept your finger in Philippians, you see. Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. It says, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. The scarlet speaks of, of suffering. Suffering. And you needn't turn to it, but 2 Timothy 3, the last scripture on that screen of your notes, 2 Timothy 3 verse 12 simply says that all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And so if we are the fruit of his finished work that the pomegranates represent, the blue and the purple and the scarlet remind us that we are of a heavenly kingdom, we are royalty, we are children of the king, but whilst here we will suffer for the name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's one way to view, that's one way to think of the pomegranate. But there's another way to look at it as well. They were on the garment around the hem and the pomegranates formed like a, like a pad between the bells to stop the bells from clanging against each other whenever the high priest was moving. And as I've said, I don't know if you've ever done a study on pomegranates, but they are an interesting study. For any information you can find of, an interesting study. We don't really see a lot of pomegranate in the UK, but they are considered a very luscious fruit out in that part of the world. I think they originated probably in around Iran and Iraq, but certainly at the time the children of Israel went to Canaan, the land was rich with pomegranate. They were there. And it's interesting because... Whenever you cut a pomegranate in two, we have a picture at home. It was a picture of a painting that was given to us. Um, and it shows two pomegranate and one sliced in two. Have you ever seen a pomegranate cut? Yeah, aye. So they're like two sections and they're filled with little seeds. Now you'll get different things told to you about the seeds of a pomegranate. But here's an interesting one that I found. And 
understand I haven't counted these, so I can't tell you that this is right. But I thought this was extremely interesting. You will read articles that will tell you that all pomegranates have the same number of seeds. Well, that's wrong to start with, but you will read articles that tell you that. But from a test that was done with something like a thousand pomegranates, the pomegranates were taken, they were cut open, and the seed in each pomegranate was counted. And they ranged from, it was, can't remember the exact figure, but they ranged from just over a hundred seeds in the smallest one to just over 1,300, I had a look there, just over 1,300 in the largest one. So there's a variety as far as, a, a variation as far as the number of seeds were concerned. But here's the thing, out of that sample, and all of the seeds were counted in every pomegranate, and you know how you work out the average value of something, you know, you add it all together and then you divide it by the number that you used as a sample. Whenever they did that, the average number of seeds in the pomegranate was 613. Now you're going to wonder what's significant about 613. Did you know that there are 613 laws in the Jewish Torah? Did you know that? The Torah is the law of God as revealed to Moses that's found in the Pentateuch, the first five books of your Bible. And there are 613 laws in the Torah. And there just happens to be an average number of 613 seeds on a sample of pomegranate that were taken and an average value counted. I just think there's something very significant about it. I don't know what it is, but, but I just think there's something very significant. Okay, the pomegranate is a very nutritional fruit. Supposed to be very good for the heart. Supposed to be very good for blood pressure and all of that sort of stuff. And, you know, they were, they were used for all kinds of things uh, as far as the ancients were concerned in the Old Testament. But look at the significance. We're going we're gonna to think for a moment or just of, of significance of some fruit in the Scripture. I've only picked three here just to show you what can be found in Scripture about them. Did you know that the apple in the scripture is the fruit of love? Greta gives me an apple every day. I'm only joking. <laughs> the, apple, the apple is the fruit of love. Now, we need to look this up. But if you, if you were to look up Deuteronomy 32, verse 10, it says, I kept him as the apple of my eye. And you'll find in nearly all of those scriptures, um, Psalm 17 and 8 is the same, the apple of the eye. And it's significant, it speaks of, of something that the Lord looks upon and it just pleases him and he wants to care for it. It's, it's the fruit of love and the apple is always expressed in that way. It's expressed in the Song of Solomon, you know, sort of nearly as a tree amongst trees. There's something very significant about that, but we'll not take the time to look at all of those scriptures, but that's, that's what they're depicting there. Okay, the apple is the fruit of love. The grape... Did you know that the grape's the emblem of joy in the scripture? You see, in John chapter 15, you know, Jesus says, I am the true vine. You're the branches. And if you go back up, we'll not look this one up either, but if you go back up into Numbers chapter 13, verses 23 and 24, the spies have gone in to Canaan and they have come back out they have cut off a cluster of grapes and it's so large that they hang it on a pole and two carry it between them. And it also says, by the way, in that verse that they brought back figs and they brought back pomegranates. But the grape is there. And you see, God's covenant is they're going to go into a land that's flowing with milk and honey that he has given to them. And so the grape, whenever you think of it, the cluster was so large. This was a land that was abundant in produce and fertility and fruitfulness. And so the, the grape signifies the emblem of joy. It's a joyous covenant relationship with the Lord. They were going into a land that could provide this tremendous, tremendous harvest of crop like this, and also Jesus being the true vine, we can enjoy the greatest of relationship with him. 
as we draw from him the sap of the vine that keeps us nourished and keeps our lives blessed and so on. And so the grape in Scripture is commonly thought of as being the, the fruit of joy or the emblem of, of joy. Now, whenever we come down to the pomegranate, and I've already touched on this, they're mentioned in Numbers chapter 13. They're part of the produce that were brought out by the spies. <coughs> Deuteronomy chapter 8. Go there with me for a moment. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 7. We're almost finished, by the way. Try not to sleep for another few minutes. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 8. Verse 7. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines, there's a grape, fig trees. And by the way, the fig in Scripture depicts the spiritual life of Israel. We didn't, I didn't do that one, but that's what the fig's all about. It has to do with the spiritual life of Israel. The pomegranates are mentioned there as well. A land of oil, olive and honey. A land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness, thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. When thou hast, hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he has given you. Okay? It's a list of the fruit and the crops that will grow in the land in abundance. And the pomegranates mentioned in there. Now, we know from Israel's history, of course, that the fertility and the fruitfulness mentioned in the land was completely dependent upon their faithfulness to the Lord. And so there were times whenever Israel got away from God, they experienced famine. And times whenever Israel got away from God, certain things happened like that. And the land did not produce in abundance the way God had told them it would produce whenever they failed to follow Yahweh. That fruitfulness disappeared as far as their experience was concerned. And you know, we see in that a picture of the life of the New Testament believer in so many ways. The New Testament believer can lose his or her fruitfulness if they neglect their relationship with the Lord. Just as the land wouldn't be fruitful if Israel neglected their relationship with the Lord. The life of the believer is exactly the same. It's a picture looking towards you and me. And pomegranates are mentioned also in the Song of Solomon. Um, they, they are mentioned in connection with conditions that seemed idyllic. Idyllic. You see, the pomegranate in the Scripture is thought of, I've written it there, fertility or fruitfulness. Mentioned in the land's abundance. They're part of that list. In the Song of Solomon, they have more to do with peace. Let's just read that. Song of Solomon, uh, chapter 6. Maybe you're in a scripture or two tonight that you wouldn't normally be in. <laughs> well, that can't be bad. Song of Solomon, chapter 6. Look at verse 11. Now, I want you to picture this in your mind, okay? I went down into the garden of nuts to see the fruits of the valley and to see whether the vine flourished and the pomegranates budded. The bud of the pomegranate has exceptional color. And it's a picture there of, of serenity. It's a picture of peace. It's a picture of, of idyllic, whatever you want to call it. It's just ideal, so it is. Look at the next chapter, chapter 7, and look at verse 12. Let us get up early to the vineyards. Let us see if the vine flourish, 
where the tender grape appear and the pomegranates bud forth, there will I give thee my loves. And the pomegranate I've written for you there, um, it's mentioned in scenes of peace and rest and beauty. And it symbolizes a peace in the scripture, symbolizes fruitfulness. It also symbolizes peace. You will find, you needn't look this one up, but you will find that whenever Solomon built the temple, outside the temple, at the front of the temple, Solomon built two huge pillars. And let me say this to you, the pillars supported nothing. They were just built and placed there. Complete ornamental pillars at the entrance into the temple. And you will, in fact, we will read this. One, one Kings chapter, chapter seven. And, and what, what he did was, whenever he made the, these great pillars, he decorated the pillars with pomegranate. One Kings chapter seven. Look at verse twenty. And the chapiters upon the two pillars had pomegranates also above, over against the belly which was by the network. It's difficult. You need to read it all through to see what he's talking about there. And the pomegranates were 200 in rows round about upon the other chapter. Okay. Look at verse 41 and 42, the same chapter. The two pillars and the two bowls of the chapters that were on the top of the two pillars and the two networks to cover the two bowls of the chapters which were upon the top of the pillars, and 400 pomegranates for the two networks, even two rows of pomegranate for one network to cover the two bowls of the chaffeters that were upon the pillars. 400 pomegranates decorated those pillars. And they just stood in front of the temple and they did absolutely nothing. They didn't support a roof or anything. They just stood there as ornaments and they were decorated with pomegranate, symbol of fruitfulness, the symbol of peace in the midst of the nation. John, have you the NLT up for those verses? Mm -hmm. read, read us verses 41 and 42 there in the NLT, will you? 41 and I chapter, that's chapter 7, 1 Kings. Yeah. The two pillars, the two bowls shaped capitals on top of the pillars, the two networks of interwoven chains that decorated the capitals, the 400 pomegranates that hung from the chains on the capitals, two rows of pomegranates for each of the chain networks that decorated the capitals on top of the pillars. The pillars. Okay, that's just giving it to you in plainer language. <laughs> okay, but that, that, that's, that's what, so they were used in, you know, as, as ornamentation in, in that particular setting. And, and as far as the temple was concerned, as I've said, they, they, they symbolized fruitfulness in the nation. The temple was the place where the worship of God would be convened. The temple was the place where everything, the, the spiritual life of Israel, their connection with God, it was a place where everything would happen. And if that was okay, there would be fruitfulness. And if that was okay, there would be peace. And so the pomegranates speak of, of both of these things, fertility or fruitfulness uh, and also um, the peace. And all of this depended completely upon the provision which God had given to them. Either given to them in blessing or withheld from them in judgment. I've given you um, the bottom there, Haggai 2 verses 14 to 19, our time's going so quick we won't read that, but that just tells you how God will, with, will withhold the fruitfulness whenever he's judging. So all this pictures his fruitfulness which is us, as it were, um, as the fruit of his finished work, and it also pictures his complete provision for us and the peace that we experience in him and the peace that we experience through him. He's the Prince of Peace. He made peace through the blood of his cross, the Bible tells us, and now in him we have peace with God and the peace of God is in our hearts. And it also pictures our complete dependence upon him if we are to be fruitful in our own lives. Very quickly, and it's just a couple of minutes and we're finished. The bells. 
Okay, it stated that although each bell had its own distinct mellow ring, they all rang together with beautiful melody whenever the high priest was adorned with these garments and whenever he was moving about. Let me explain something very, very quickly about the high priest. The high priest did not wear these garments in the Holy of Holies whenever he went in to present the blood. He would go into the holy place he would be away from where the people could see him. They heard the bells as he went in. And in the holy place, he took off all of his regalia except the linen garment. Because whenever he would go in to present the blood, it was a time of humiliation. And so he wore only his linen garment. He went into the holy of holies and he presented the blood and he sprinkled the blood upon the mercy seat. Once he had that done, he came back out of the Holy of Holies into the holy place, and once again he put on the garments that we're looking at here. And as soon as he began to do that and began to move, the bells, the bells rung, and the people who were outside waiting to see if the blood had been accepted, they realized he's still alive. He didn't die in the Holy of Holies, so therefore, the offering has been accepted by God and the bells rang and the people knew the offering had been accepted. And you know, we can think about the gospel message in all of that because you know, praise God, the gospel rings out to you and to me the fact that what Christ has done has been accepted. We're not looking up and up either for time's sake. Ephesians 4 verse 8 says, He led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. And the reason that we know that this has been accepted by Almighty God is because He has set us free. Amen. We have the gift of salvation. We have the gift of grace. We have the gift of reconciliation with God. We have the gift of God's blessing upon our lives. We have the gift of the peace of God. We have the gift of eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. The gifts have been given to us. They're like bells that ring out the fact that our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, has offered a sacrifice, offered his blood, and it's completely acceptable in the sight of God. And he gives gifts, even spiritual gifts, whenever we even come to that particular part of it. Okay. And as he moved, the bells rang. And the gospel rings out the fact that all of this in the sight of God has been completely acceptable. And we see the hem of the garment, gift fruit, gift fruit, gift fruit. And all, I'm just reading it off the screen, all the different aspects of the fruit of the Spirit that you will find in Galatians chapter 5. And you know, we did that study on the fruit of the Spirit. They are all the one fruit. And the fruit really is love. All different aspects. The love that we experience inwardly. Love, joy, and peace. The love that we express outwardly, the long suffering and so on. And the love that we express upwardly, our temperance and our faith in Almighty God. And you know the full list, they split into, into three groups of three. Love. And so Paul in 1 Corinthians, and I mentioned this whenever we did the, the gifts of the Spirit. Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 and 1 says, you know, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, if I don't have love, he says, I'm become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And some commentators would, would reckon that perhaps Paul, in his thoughts, had these bells around the high priest's garment in mind. And if they're not functioning with love, with love, he says, they just clatter against each other. And he says, they make nothing distinct. It's just a noise. And so around the high priest's garment, you have a gift a gift which God has given, and then you have a fruit which is love. You have another gift, and then you have a fruit which is love. And together, they harmonize completely. They present to us everything that the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. And we know, praise God, that everything that he has done has been completely accepted by Almighty God because we experience these things in our own lives. Amen. Amen.